questions. Uh, hi, everyone. So, yeah, thank you for yeah, taking the time and coming listening to my talk this evening, uh, which is called yeah, Real-Time Communications, Real-Time Risk. And this is where I'll be taking you through yeah, a short journey through kind of the land of real-time applications and hopefully share some knowledge on some of the threats that WebSocket-based applications have. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Just uh, yeah, a short obligatory slide from yeah, myself. So to keep it short, my name is Elliot, and I'm a security researcher at Sneak. If you don't know Sneak, uh, we're a kind of developer security company uh, that provides a platform for kind of yeah, DevSecOps tooling. Uh, I'm originally from the UK, but I've been living in Switzerland now for the last six years in Zurich. Um, and yeah, you'll generally find me in the winter in the mountains snowboarding and skateboarding in the summer. So that's me. Uh, to give a, yeah, a summary of what we're going to cover, uh, we'll first have a look at the yeah, various needs for real-time applications and the techniques that we can use to facilitate this before familiarizing ourselves with the WebSocket protocol and its threat landscape. We'll then have a look at the, some of the results from our research uh, into WebSocket-based applications before finally sharing our new burp extension uh, for yeah, testing WebSocket-based applications. So today, it's, it's fairly common for us to see applications with some kind of real-time uh, capacity in, in some form. Uh, and this is present across a, yeah, a wide range of uh, yeah, categories. But some of the most common ones include um, yeah, instant messaging, collaboration, uh, gaming, uh, and conferencing software. And when we kind of think about the reasons why application using some of these techniques, it's quite clear. I mean, the benefits of instant feedback, a more interactive user interface, which allows for yeah, a better user experience and yeah, increased product engagement is, is, is quite clear. Uh, so, I mean, if we quickly just take a, go back a couple of decades and we can have a look at some of the early techniques that were being used to enable some form of uh, limited real-time interactions. So, I mean, back in the 2000s and not long after, yeah, the web was full of websites that looked like this. Um, there was a couple of techniques that existed, so they were very primitive. Um, and yeah, I mean, we had meta refresh, which is basically a, a HTML meta tag, which was allowed the user or allowed the developers to automatically refresh the page within a certain amount of time. Um, but obviously, this approach is not very efficient and results in a terrible user experience uh, due to the page constantly reloading. Um, then, similar to this, we have JavaScript timers, so we can use set timeout, set interval. Um, and these could be used to automatically refresh the page or pull uh, some updates from yeah, an external server at regular intervals. It's not long polling, yeah, it's not long polling but this is uh, one of the kind of techniques that kind of led to this. Um, and then we can combine the, the two above uh, there with kind of hidden iframes. So with yeah, hidden iframes, this allows us to basically uh, kind of hide the refreshing um, and have a what looks like a more friendly user experience. And then other than this, we have the, uh, yeah, the world of Java applets and Flash. And I think we're all quite glad that this is a thing of the past now. Um, but data could be read from a remote server, similar to how using any kind of TCP socket would. Um, and then we had a very pr early form of XH XML HTTP request that was present in Internet Explorer 5 and Mozilla 1. Um, and yeah, this led, to the, led the path to kind of the modern Ajax that we know now. So let's go back to kind of what we're looking at now in the current light landscape. So the first modern approach to allowing real-time feel is through the use of Ajax short polling. And this works by having the browser send a HTTP Ajax request to the server. Um, and then the server sends back some data or sends an empty response if no updates are available at the time. Um, and then this process is repeated when new updates are required. Um, and this gives kind of the, the, the feel of a real-time application using a stateless and reliable approach. But the main drawbacks are that the approach is non-adaptive in that state updates need to be requested by the client and they're not going to be automatically pushed to the client by the server. Um, and there's also a higher latency and overhead due to new HTTP requests uh, required for every single update. Uh, similar to the yeah, Ajax short polling is an approach called HTTP long polling. Um, but with this, instead of returning an empty response when there's no data available, the server will keep the request open. Um, and then when some data becomes available, uh, it will then go ahead and send that uh, down the open connection that's waiting. 
So this is also kind of easy to implement and stateless, but it's a little bit more complex um, and it's a little bit more resource intensive as we need to keep these uh, yeah, connections available and also we have some potential reliability problems, particularly uh, when this was first around with kind of intermediaries that may drop the request uh, or just general internet connectivity issues. And then we kind of move on to kind of the more modern approaches. Um, so one of these is called server sent events. And this is a normal HTTP request with a couple of extra uh, special headers that cause the server to keep the connection open um, and basically send the browser events through this uh, established connection. Um, the, it's, it's, it's easy to implement and the browser API for setting this up automatically supports reconnection, which is quite useful. Um, but the main drawback here is that this is only one way. So only the server can send data to the client and not the other way around. And when we want to do this, then we need to go to WebSockets. So we'll get to the main topic of today, which is WebSockets. And these allow us to have a low latency bidirectional data exchange. This starts with a handshake, which we'll cover shortly. Uh, and allows, well, yeah, once set up, allows messages to be sent freely from both the client and the server. Uh, the same drawbacks apply to WebSockets as the server side events, server sent events, um, and we'll soon learn about kind of the potential security implications of using WebSockets. So let's have a look at WebSockets. The first thing that happens when setting up a WebSocket session is the yeah, WebSocket handshake. And this is a regular HTTP request with a couple of special headers. The first thing that happens is the, we have the yeah, connection header, and in this we'll specify that we want to update, so we have the uh, connection upgrade header. And then we'll set the WebSocket version, um, and then we'll set a random value which is used as the WebSocket key. When the server gets this and wants to agree to uh, yeah, negotiate the WebSocket request, um, we'll switch to speaking WebSockets, and this will return a yeah, 101 status code which means switching protocols, uh, and then it will set the connection header to WebSocket, uh, connection, uh, sorry, the upgrade header to WebSocket, connection header to upgrade, and then it will take the value of the set WebSocket key that was sent by the request handshake, um, and it will append this to a fixed constant. It will SHA-1 this, and then it will base64 encode this, and set this in the set WebSocket accept header. So once that's all gone and we've uh, agreed to yeah, speak WebSocket, the actual uh, communication uh, happens in encoded frames. So the, the frames are fairly simple and there's a couple of different opcodes that we use here. Um, so we have continuation frames that are yeah, indicating that a continuation frame is from a fragmented message. Um, then we have a text frame which indicates that the contents of that is just text data and it should be interpreted as UTF-8. Then we have binary frames that indicates that the payload is yeah, binary data. Uh, connection close, which allows one peer to basically close the, the WebSocket connection. And then we have ping and pong, which is used to check if another peer is responsiveness. Uh, so if the peer sends a, or receives a ping, then it's expected that it should send a pong back. Um, and if it doesn't receive the expected pong, then it will send the connection close. Um, an important part of this data exchange, though, is payload masking, and this helps to prevent an intermediary server, such as any WAV or yeah, reverse proxy, from misinterpreting WebSocket data frames as HTTP content, and this could lead to kind of request smuggling or cash poisoning attacks. So when we do this, the, uh, it's only mandatory for the client to mask its requests, um, and it will yeah, mask the, the data payload. And this is then using a 32-bit random value, which is then XORed against the data payload in a circular fashion. Um, and then yeah, when the server sends mes messages back to the client, this is, the masking key is then set to uh, zero. And here we just have an example of some WebSocket traffic, and in the top you'll see the, website, the WebSocket handshake request. Below that is the WebSocket handshake response. Following that is the data frame exchange, and as you can see, the client to server frame is masked, so we can't see what the content is just by inspecting the traffic, um, and the yeah, server to client frame is not, so we, we can see that right away. So let's have a look at, well, yeah, that's enough on the, the protocol itself, so let's have a look at the, yeah, what the threat landscape for WebSockets looks like. 
So we'll get the boring stuff out of the way first. And while it's not very interesting from an attacker's perspective, uh, the, masking bit, the masking itself could lead to kind of some of observability issues into WebSocket, WebSocket traffic. Uh, this is particularly if kind of an, an intermediary or DLP solution doesn't understand WebSockets. So it's possible that yeah, if people are sending data out via WebSockets, uh, that if yeah, the, the intermediary doesn't understand that, it could be, yeah, go undetected. Um, and then we also have the risk of sniffing due to yeah, using WebSockets over plain text HTTP, but if you can sniff HTTP, that you can also sniff the WebSockets. But again, yeah, this is not so interesting. And also kind of not on the interesting side, we have denial of service attacks. Um, just due to the kind of masking frame, uh, it could be that yeah, when handling bad data, we may end up with some denial of service conditions. We had a brief look at this, um, and yeah, we did some fuzzing on the, the different opcodes and uh, yeah, frames in WebSockets, but we didn't really find anything too interesting there. Um, we did see that some implementations have their own custom protocols. So for example, Socket.io adds in some extra things that allow for namespaces, reconnections, and so on, and yeah, with this, there has been some known issues, um, but yeah, as I've said, we weren't too interested in denial of service issues, so we didn't look into this any further. Now, where things start to get a little bit more interesting uh, is where WebSockets don't have their own uh, yeah, authentication mechanism themselves, but this should be okay, right, because the, the handshake request contains the authentication cookie, um, and due to the same origin policy, we should be okay. So let's see if this is really the case. And to first have a look at this, we need to understand the same origin policy. Uh, the same origin policy is a browser-based security mess mechanism that restricts what data one origin can access from another. Um, so it, whether or not one web page can read the content from another page or can request access to certain resources. Um, this can be relaxed via cause, but this is not the subject of the talk today, so we won't be going into cause. Um, but restrictions apply based on the definition of an origin. An origin is specified by a scheme, a host, and a port. Um, and we'll see how this uh, applies based on the kind of different scenarios here. So if Sneak.io tries to access google.com. This will not be allowed due to different domain. If one subdomain on Sneak tries to access another subdomain, this will again not be allowed due to a different subdomain. Uh, if a HTTP site tries to access a TLS site, this will also not be allowed because this is a different schema. And if uh, we have two services, what list? two services on different ports, then this will also not be allowed because this is a different port. But when we have the, everything matching, then we're, we, we, we are considered the same origin um, and uh, the same origin policy should only allow uh, data to be read uh, when these two match. So let's just kind of have a look at how this looks in practice. So if somebody goes to evil.io, uh, they will load this page and evil.io contains some JavaScript that will reach out to sneak.io. So if that JavaScript tries to access a get request to my profile, uh, it should go ahead and send this. The cookies will be sent in most cases, providing that it's using cookie-based authentication, and the response will be sent back to the browser. But the key distinction here is that the response is not released. So the, the JavaScript on the page, when it actually tries to do this, it will get a cause error, and it won't be able to read that response. So now we come to yeah, WebSocket hijacking. Um, so due to how this same origin policy, uh, yeah, all right, so yeah, the same origin policy doesn't apply to WebSockets as we have uh, it showed in that last slide. Um, so th this brings up a new class of issues called website cross-site WebSocket hijacking. Um, and yeah, you're not always vulnerable to this just because of. Um, the same origin policy not applying. It could be that there's additional authentication happening during the handshake request. It could be that there's additional, hand, additional authentication happening within the established tunnel, or it could be that there's some manual origin checks happening. So when we're kind of yeah, looking at same origin policy with WebSockets, 
this is how it would look when uh, a WebSocket hijacking attack would take place. So uh, again, we make the request to evil.io, it sends back a page, and on this page there's some JavaScript that establishes a WebSocket to sneak, and this will go through and set up this WebSocket handshake. Um, and once that WebSocket handshake has taken place, then we have a bi-directional channel, and in here, evil.io uh, can read and write to the data that's on there. So this leads to the cross-site WebSocket hijacking. So how, how prevalent are the, these issues? So in order to have a like, look at this, uh, we'll first identify some, some popular WebSocket-based applications or some candidates for WebSocket applications, and then we'll check them for WebSocket usage. Then we'll look to see kind of, are, do these look vulnerable or not? So are they using cookies instead of header-based authentication? Um, because if we try to issue a cross-site WebSocket request and they're using an authorization header, this will not automatically be sent with the request. So we're not gonna be able to perform an attack there. Um, and then we also need to make sure that they're not doing any additional authentication checks, whether via the handshake or inside the WebSocket itself. And then we wanna verify that they're also not doing any origin checks. And then once that's done, um, we can then see, is there anything else that could prevent us from exploiting this, such as same site cookies? So we looked at about between 50 and 60 applications in total. Uh, I've not put them all here, but I've put kind of just a, a subset. Um, and with this, we first checked to see, okay, are they using WebSockets? Um, this was a list of some of the ones that were using WebSockets. And then, okay, are they doing an origin check or are they doing any additional authorization check? Uh, yeah, authentication check. Um, and yeah, in this case, these are some of the results. Um, just to clarify kind of, here, the absence of the checks doesn't necessarily mean that this was an issue. In some of the cases, an application would set up a WebSocket and not actually send any data over it. In some cases, um, yeah, it could be that there's header-based authentication, so with this, we couldn't uh, exploit anything. Um, and also, in order for it to really be exploitable, we needed some sort of same site cookie bypass or the same site cookie to be explicitly set to none. Um, so to go over this, just on some of the uh, results that we had there, so um, yeah, Gitpod, which is a, quite a big cloud, develop, cloud development environment, which allows uh, yeah, engineers or companies to have their IDEs in the cloud with the click of a button um, on there. Um, yeah, we had both a same site cookie bypass and WebSocket hijacking issue that led to a full IDE compromise, and with this, we were able to take over um, through a website hijacking issue any um, yeah, IDE within that company. Um, so this obviously gave access to source code there, um, anything that's on that developer's machine at the time. Um, another example was yeah, NodeBB, which is just kind of, kind of messaging board based in uh, Node, and this was leaking private messages. Uh, an XMPP client was also disallowed a, a full account takeover via WebSocket hijacking. The Visual Studio Code Server, um, the, the, yeah, Visual Studio Code Server, um, this also allowed for a full IDE uh, takeover. And Daytona, formerly known as Code Anywhere, um, it's not open source, so there's no CVE associated with this, um, but we had two issues with them. Um, one which allowed us to connect directly to anybody's uh, yeah, IDE based on a flaw within their WebSocket proxy that they implemented and a typical WebSocket hijacking issue. And then we have a couple of others which are still in the disclosure process. One in quite a large EDR pod or EDP project um, that was leaking CRM data, uh, one in a customer support platform, and one in a course management platform. So aside from the WebSocket hijacking issues, we also have to worry about traditional vulnerabilities. So within the WebSocket protocol, we're allowing arbitrary messages to be exchanged, and those underlying protocols are susceptible to a number of attacks. Um, and we need to make sure that we allow proper security testing against those. So there could be authorization bypasses, logic bugs, uh, crypto flaws, all of the kind of typical 
web pen test issues will apply to the messages that are within the web sockets themselves. But the problem is that the current tooling is a little bit limited. So while we can perform testing against WebSocket based applications, um, yeah, the tooling compared to traditional HTTP based applications is somewhat limited. So we have some kind of open source tools like WebSocket King and Hopscotch. And these allow kind of a nice capability for just sending a message. Um, but it's kind of more similar to Postman. Um, and it doesn't allow us to kind of do any specific security tests. Um, OWASP Zap is great, um, but it's a little bit less popular and not as many people are using it. Um, so there's also like the, the extension ecosystem for Zap isn't as strong as it is for Burp. Um, and Burp itself, while this is our favorite tool and the one that we would like to be using, um, it lacks a lot of the, the automation features that it has for regular HTTP requests. And with this, I mean, we have no intruder, we have no match and replace rules, um, and uh, the general workflow is kind of less intuitive as compared to regular web HTTP testing because you can't see, uh, like for example, easily which requests came from which handshake um, uh, and this kind of stuff. So with this, we've introduced a new uh, burp extension for yeah, testing web applications for WebSocket issues called Socket Sleuth. Um, and we chose burp because this is the tool that we use the most, and we feel that the, the community are also mostly using burp suite. Um, and this is made possible through the new Montoya API, um, which added support for uh, WebSockets to burp for the first time. Um, and as far as we know at the moment, this is the first WebSocket extension for Burp, um, but we're not entirely sure, but it's at least on the BAP store and from what we found online, there isn't any currently out there. Um, for the initial features, we kind of have an, an optimized WebSocket history view, uh, an intruder style fuzzer for the WebSockets, um, an auto repeater utility and match and replace rules. Um, which we'll get to. And we have submitted this to the, the BAP store. It's still in the process of uh, yeah, being reviewed, um, but this is available via our GitHub and the link will be uh, on, a, for, on another slide. So kind of just to kind of show uh, how, how this looks. So once this is installed, we have kind of a new view here where we can see all of the different WebSocket connection or handshakes that we have, which ones are alive, how many messages have been sent in each uh, WebSocket, and to the right, when you click this, you can easily see the WebSocket handshake request for this. Um, and then down on the bottom corner, you can see all of the messages specific to that WebSocket and the, uh, the, 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 the content of that. Um, if we go over to the other slide, we can see there that we have kind of just a match and replace, uh, which is exactly what it says it is, but while it's very simple, it's quite a powerful feature, and we were surprised to see that this wasn't already implemented in Burp for WebSockets. Um, and then we have what we call the, the auto-repeater, and this is based on kind of auto-repeater for HTTP requests, which is the name of the plugin, um, and also authorize, which if you have been using Burp and done any authorization testing, um, it, it's very useful. So. How this works is on the, the top panel, we see all of the uh, available WebSockets, and we can set a source and a destination. Uh, when we set the source, all packet, all, all WebSocket messages uh, that are from that and match the direction, whether this is bi-directional, client to server, uh, or server to client, will be forwarded to uh, the destination socket. Um, so how we set this up is we have two different browser sessions, one user's logged in in one, another user's logged in in the other, uh, and then we set this up so it will send messages from user A to user B and allows us to very easily uh, perform authorization testing without having to manually go through um, and yeah, copy requests or messages from one to the other. Uh, and then we have kind of a WebSocket uh, sniper-like utility. So in this, basically, we have uh, the, the WebSocket view here. Um, with that, we can set payload insertion points, 
And then on the right here, we have uh, a couple of different options for what payloads are supported. At the moment, we only support simple lists and numeric ranges. Um, this will be uh, yeah, added to in the future. Um, and then yeah, when you hit start, it will go ahead and uh, perform that attack and allow you to see which messages have had which responses and basically allow you to do kind of, yeah, automated fuzzing against WebSocket messages, which wasn't possible with BERT before. So, yeah, the, the extension is available uh, on our GitHub. Um, you can access that on the, the QR code. Uh, if you don't trust the QR code, then the link's there. Um, but hopefully, people find this useful. We think it should be, yeah, quite useful. Um, and we'll be adding to this based on, yeah, user feedback. And then we have kind of a bonus topic as well. So, um, Mikhail, I can't pronounce his name, um, but he, he's previously done some interesting work that was looking to see in which scenarios it's possible to smuggle HTTP requests through an intermediary proxy via tricking the intermediary into thinking that a WebSocket connection had been established when it hadn't. Um, so he, he was able to show that some proxies could be tricked uh, by tampering with the WebSocket version header, so by specifying invalid WebSocket uh, versions. Um, he was also able to show that an attacker could control the status, or if an attacker could control the status code of the request, that some proxies would automatically treat this as a WebSocket um, without checking the rest of the handshake. So for example, if somebody was able to uh, inject a 101 status code to the response, um, then this could lead to a situation where WebSocket, where HTTP requests could be smuggled through a fake WebSocket. And while this is cool, it, it's quite contrived. I don't know about you, but I've personally never seen uh, a real application where I was able to control the status code that was uh, returned in the response. Um, but other than that, we've not seen much research into this, so we had another look and tried to see if there's anything else there. Um, so this involved kind of, yeah, checking popular WebSocket libraries for their handling of invalid uh, handshake requests. This didn't lead to any uh, issues, unfortunately, um, but we did check some reverse proxies for their handling of invalid um, handshake requests. And while the invalid handshake requests uh, didn't lead to anything, we did find one scenario that was quite interesting. Um, so once this is kind of set up, um, in this case, uh, it's through a yeah, header injection issue. So I mean, we've all kind of seen carriage return line feed injections, and this typically leads to a, a client side attack um, where you can turn a header injection into an XSS or inject some other arbitrary information in the response. Um, but we found that a couple of the reverse proxies, um, if you have a header injection issue, um, we could then inject the connection uh, WebSocket header, um, and once we've done this, the reverse proxy would then keep this connection alive, um, and it would no longer in inspect any of the content that was going through. So this allowed us to bypass any routing rules um, in this specific proxy. We're still in the process of uh, disclosing this, so I can't go into the details of which proxies are affected. Um, but this is being upgraded and uh, we'll have a full uh, blog post about this coming up with the various implications that this had on some other ecosystems. And yeah, here is kind of an example on what this looks like. So I mean, here we have a request where uh, we, we make a get request to slash denied and we get back the response that says denied. Um, we go ahead and run the attack, um, which basically injects these headers into the response of our uh, or into our HTTP response. Um, as you can see, the HTTP status code is still 200, but we have uh, these additional headers, so upgrade WebSocket and connection upgrade. This resulted in the connection being held open, um, and then we can make a request again to slash denied, and as you can see that this has bypassed those routing rules. Um, so it's quite interesting and uh, we think it's a fairly novel way of using a typical uh, header injection vulnerability um, and yeah, we'll be yeah, disclosing kind of the details on uh, the affected ecosystem soon. 
so yeah, thank you for taking the time for listening to me. Um, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.